I'm Dr. Arya Falla. I'm a pediatric neurosurgeon here at UCLA Mattel Children's Hospital, and it's my absolute pleasure to be here with you today to discuss a topic that's of a very special interest of mine, tuberosclerosis complex, and specifically the management of epilepsy through surgery. I encourage you to ask any questions that you may have via Facebook or Twitter using the hashtag UCLAMDChat. I'll be happy to answer your questions at the end of this presentation. So what is tuberous sclerosis complex? So tuberous sclerosis complex is a rare genetic disorder that causes benign growths throughout the body, including the brain, and other vital organs such as the heart, the lungs, the kidneys, the skin, the eyes. And this can lead, specifically the, the deposits on the brain, can lead to epilepsy, autism, developmental delay, and as well some psychiatric disorders. This is a brain of a child with tuberous sclerosis complex. As you can see, the brain is supposed to look symmetrical. These spots, these white spots on the brain are abnormal. And they're the cause of, that's what, what it is, is tubers in the brain that are not supposed to be there, these abnormal uh, deposits or architectural change in the brain. So as I mentioned before, tuberous sclerosis is truly a multi-organ disorder, and it can affect many organ systems. So as a neurosurgeon, I specialize in the brain, and as you can see, there's subependymal nodules, there are certain tumors that are very specific to tuberous sclerosis that occur in the brain, such as uh, SEGAs, subependymal giant cell astrocytoma, as well as cortical tubers. You can also have lesions in the eyes, the lungs, in the heart you can have cardiac rhabdomyomas which are usually benign tumors that can cause uh, obstructions in the heart which is also very important for us to know as surgeons. Um, there's skin lesions as well uh, and kidney lesions. So really it, it affects the entire uh, body. There's a diagnostic criteria of tuberous sclerosis complex which I won't get, I won't get into in much detail. Again, the focus of this talk being uh, epilepsy surgery, but it's important to know that there are major features and minor features, and to get a diagnosis of tuberous sclerosis complex, you require at least two of the major features, or one major feature with more than two of the minor features. And here's a list that, that you can look at uh, at a later time. So when I say tuberous sclerosis is a genetic comp, uh, disorder, what does that mean? That means that the abnormality lies in the DNA within every cell in the body. There's two major genes that can lead to a diagnosis of tuberous sclerosis complex, either a mutation in the TSC1 gene or a mutation in the TSC2 gene. And the TSC1 gene is associated with a certain protein called hamartin, while the TSC2 gene is associated with a different protein called tuberin. TSC2 is a lot more common than TSC1. At the same time, TSC2 tends to affect uh, the child much more severely than TSC1. On the other hand, TSC1 tends to be more the inherited form of the, of the disease. And we think of it as the familial type as opposed to the TSC2 type, which is commonly associated with more spontaneous mutations. So these are children with tuberous sclerosis complex that don't have any of their parents affected with tuberous sclerosis complex. As mentioned here, so the, the, there's a certain inheritance pattern of this uh, gene and it's uh, an autosomal dominant pattern. What does that mean? That means that children have about a 50% chance of inheritance from uh, either parent that, that may be affected with this disorder. The incidence of tuberous sclerosis is one out of every 6,000 uh, children. It's much more common to have the spontaneous form of the disorder, which is usually associated with TSC2, as opposed to TSC1. So two-thirds of the time, you have the spontaneous mutation. So this is a child that has, that has developed tuberous sclerosis complex from a mutation in the DNA, but that mutation is not found in the parents. And about 70 to 40 percent, so less than half of the children 
affected by tuberous sclerosis complex have the familial or the inherited subtype of tuberous sclerosis complex. So this is a nice slide that captures all the problems that can usually happen that affect the central nervous system, or mainly the brain, in children, ch in children with tuberous sclerosis complex. So seizures, behavioral problems, and developmental delay can be uh, quite common. T tubers are present in almost all of the children affected with this dis disorder, and I'll go into a little bit more detail of what tubers actually are. There can be changes in the white matter of the brain. There can be nodules alongside the fluid spaces of the brain. Again, I'll show you a picture of this in a second. And there's a specific tumor called the SEGA, which can be present in about 10 to 20% of the population affected with tuberous sclerosis complex. Now, children with tuberous sclerosis complex have a 90% chance of developing epilepsy. In fact, even though tuberous sclerosis is very rare, it is the leading cause of a genetic form of epilepsy in children. Developmental delays can be quite uh, common. Autism in less than half uh, of this population, sleep problems, aggression, um, ADHD, anxiety, depression, and, and learning difficulties can be also quite common in this population. So here's a few facts about tuberous sclerosis. So, about 85% of the children develop epilepsy, and this can be in the form of either infantile spasms, which are these brief jerky movements, or full-on seizures, which involve an involuntary movement um, with one body part or another. And, and seizures can actually be very, very um, uh, subtle. So it can just be a behavioral change or a behavioral stare or it can manifest as a full-on movement of the arms and legs that can be very quite, uh, can be quite obvious and dramatic and everyone can recognize it. 25% of the children develop these infantile spasms, which again are these brief jerky movements that can last less than a second. And usually uh, when this occurs, it happens in the first few months of life, and hence called infantile spasms. Seizures often start before the age of two. So this is something that you're likely to pick up or find out uh, before the child is a toddler. 60% of children fail to control their seizures with medication alone, and that's really, really important because it tells you that even though the first treatment is anti-seizure uh, anti drugs, if your child has a seizure, is that the majority of children will eventually not be controlled with medications alone, and that's why it's very important to be evaluated for possible surgery to try to cure the seizures, and I'll talk to you about that in a little bit. Again, cognitive de deficits, autism, behavioral problems can all be associated with tuberous sclerosis themselves and more commonly with the abnormal electricity that occurs from seizures during tuberous sclerosis complex. So it's very, very important to try to stop the seizures as much as we can and as much as we safely can to try to give the child the best cognitive outcome uh, down the road. So the four main findings in the brain in children with tuberous sclerosis complex are the following. So the cortical dysplasia, which refers to abnormal brain architecture. And this often can occur right next to tubers. So um, uh, cortical dysplasia doesn't refer to a, any mass or, or, or tumor in the brain, but it refers to that the normal layers of the brain can be quite disorganized. And for whatever reason, that can be very, very prone to causing epilepsy, in particular the type of epilepsy that does, that does not respond to medications. Cortical tubers are disorganized area of the brain that contains abnormal cells, so these are large looking uh, neurons or abnormal looking neurons, and the architecture of the brain can again uh, be off. And I'll show you a picture of a tuber in the next slide. Now some children have many, many tubers all over the brain, and for some children they may just have one. Subappendable giant cell astrocytoma, so these are tumors that are very, very specific to tuberous sclerosis complex and they occur deep inside the brain, uh, usually surrounding the fluid spaces of the brain, which are called the ventricles. And it is a non-cancerous brain tumor, however, it can cause problems by growing. And one of the main problems it can cause is obstruction of the brain fluid from being normally circulated throughout the brain. A an obstruction of that brain fluid can cause 
a very serious and sometimes a life-threatening problem where we may have to do surgery right away. But if this is detected early and followed, most of the time nowadays we can treat this with a specific medication called Everlimus. Uh, and this tends to shrink the tumors the vast majority of the time. If that doesn't work, then surgery is always an option. Lastly, there's these subependymal nodules. So these are small accumulations of cells right around the fluid spaces of the brain. And these themselves can also be a cause of seizures. So it's very important to be very carefully evaluated to see where exactly the seizures may be coming from in a child with tuberous sclerosis complex. So this is a cartoon of the brain showing those four things that we talked about. So the obvious thing here in the middle, this tumor right in the center of the brain, close to the fluid spaces of the brain, is called a SEGA. This is a tumor. If this is detected, we would like to follow it up with serial MRI scans and make sure that it doesn't cause a problem by growing. Obviously, if it grows, we can consider that medication. However, if it's, at a, a, if it's critically large or it's causing a obstruction of the brain fluid, and here you can see the fluid space on this side of the brain is larger than the other, so it's obstructing some of the brain fluid. Sometimes when that's happening and the child is symptomatic, we consider surgery first. White matter lesions are very common in tuberous sclerosis, and here it's a little bit difficult to see on the screen but there's abnormalities here. So um, tuberous sclerosis tends to be what we call a migrational disorders and a migrational disorder. And that means that the cells that are normally made around the fluid spaces and they have to travel to the surface of the brain don't travel all the way there. So the white matter, which is uh, the, the normal space around the ventricle, may contain some of these abnormal cells. So it's very important as a pediatric neurosurgeon to pay attention to those white matter lesions because one of the main causes of failure of um, tuberous sclerosis surgery for epilepsy is ignoring some of that uh, white matter disease as well. Cortical tubers, tubers uh, as a surgeon they feel like little potatoes in the brain and the brain kind of feels like a jelly with these little uh, hard nodules and those are called tubers and sometimes they can be calcified and that means is it's, it's very hard, it's like rock hard or bone hard uh, and can be deposited on the surface of the brain and these are the primary culprits of epilepsy that we go after. We try to figure out which one of these multiple tubers is causing the seizures. Lastly, the subependymal nodules, a little bit harder to see, but these are these little growths on the inside of the ventricles or the fluid spaces and again these can also be a cause of uh, seizure. So very important to pay attention to those as well. This is what a cortical tuber looks like. I want to draw your attention to this part of the brain which looks normal. So this is what we call a gray matter of the brain. There's a ribbon of gray matter and underneath it is white matter. If you look over here you see loss of that architecture of the brain so you don't see the gray matter on top that well and the white matter. So that's a location. This is what a cortical tuber may look like. Interestingly, you can see these little spots too, and these are those subependymal nodules that I talked about. So um, we know from treating um, many, many kids with epilepsy and adults with epilepsy that when you have a brain structural abnormality, and specifically something like tuberous sclerosis complex, where uh, there is a structural abnormality in the brain, the ch chance of having persistent seizures despite the best medical therapy is quite high. In fact, in this um, seminal paper published in 2000, one of the most prestigious journals, the New England Journal of Medicine, we found that just less than half of all patients with epilepsy respond to the first medication, so those seizures may stop their first medication. Another 10% may respond to adding a second medication. But after that, when you look at adding a third medication or fourth medication, the likelihood of success is almost close to zero. So it's usually in the 1% to 3% range. So this tells us very quickly that we're going to figure out if a child is going to respond to further medications or not. Every day there's more and more medications, and it's very important uh, to, especially when we're dealing with a child, is not to lose time in terms of escalating treatment. Because a child can spend 
years and years trying each new medication that comes out. But we know very quickly that if the first two medications haven't worked, the chance of further medications working is, is really, really slim. So we need to think about other treatment approaches. So why do we even consider epilepsy surgery? It, to some, that may sound very radical. Why do we need to do a, a brain operation to stop seizures? The answer is quite simple. Some of the disorders that are very, very difficult to treat the epilepsy with medications, such as tuberous sclerosis, can sometimes be the easiest to treat with surgery. And we know that. So epilepsy surgery hasn't, it's not a new thing. It's been around for many, many years, many, many decades. And there's many, many benefits to stopping seizures. First, the, the first goal of epilepsy surgery is to either stop or lessen seizures as much as we can. We want to prevent the harmful consequences of seizures, including early death. As you can imagine, if you have a seizure that can lead to accidents, falls, you can break your bone, you can injure yourself, you can drown in a swimming pool. So there's a, there's a lot of concerns for a child who has seizures. There's also this entity called sudden death related to epilepsy, SUDEP, and it's about a 1% chance per year, which may seem low, but if you take a young child and you multiply that over the course of their lifetime, that can be a significant risk. So as much as we can, we'd like to lower that risk or eliminate it altogether by treating the seizures if possible. We want to prevent the cognitive, behavioral, and psychosocial problems related to epilepsy. Epilepsy has a Traditionally, a lot of stigmatization for children that have seizures. This can result in bullying. It can result in being um, marginalized in society. So as much as we can, as, um, as neurosurgeons and neurologists, we'd like to stop the seizures if we can. If not, lower them as much as possible. We also want to avoid the side effects of medication in a growing child's brain. We don't know what side effects these medications have. And for a developing child, we think it's very important that if we can limit the amount of medical therapy, or at least not add on more and more, that could potentially be very beneficial to the child. So how do we find the epileptogenic tuber? This is one of the, uh, one of the uh, discussion topics that comes up quite frequently when we discuss children with tuberous sclerosis. Especially as you can imagine, there can be tubers all over the brain, and we have to figure out which one or two, and sometimes three tubers, may be causing the seizures. So to do that, um, we have a number of tools available to our disposal. First involves seeing a neurologist, so they characterize the seizures, and sometimes nowadays videos are very helpful because you can show your neurologist, and based on the appearance of the seizure, they can tell you where the seizure, or at least they can have a uh, guess as to where the seizures may be coming from. Now, with uh, tuberous sclerosis, like I said earlier, sometimes infantile spasms could be a form of uh, seizures. And it's very important to know that in a child, even though they have a, uh, a generalized appearing epilepsy where both parts of the body shake, that can still be attributed to maybe one particular seizure, uh, one particular tuber. A video EEG is commonly performed where a child comes in hospital and we record these episodes while monitoring their EEG. An MRI scan, specifically a very high quality MRI scan, is required to look at all the tubers in the brain. And a PET scan as well where we can, this is a PET scan and it shows the areas of the brain that are less active than others and areas that are less active could indicate an area where that's where the seizures are coming from. The reason why is when you're having a seizure, that area of the brain is very, very active, but normally when we get a PET scan, the child's not having a seizure, and that, and that area of the brain can actually look less active than the rest of the brain. And that can sometimes give us a clue as to where the seizures are coming from. Diffusion tensor imaging, magnetoencephalography, these are other ways that we can, uh, other tools that we can use to try to pinpoint where the seizures are coming from. Intraoperative EEG, so sometimes at the time of surgery, most commonly whenever we have to do surgery, we do an EEG directly from the surface of the brain, and that can give us very useful information. And sometimes we have to do an EEG implantation through surgery where we're still not sure, and we have to put an uh, electrode implanted directly on the surface of the brain to try to capture these episodes and be exactly sure where the seizures are coming from. So this is the brain of a child with tuberous sclerosis, and you can, as you can see, 
There are tubers all over the brain. In fact, there are way too many to even count reliably. So when we see a child like this, one of the greatest uh, uh, challenges is try to figure out where the, tuber, where the seizures are coming from. And for this very reason, treating children with tuberous sclerosis complex for their epilepsy is actually extremely challenging. So for, for this reason, you need to be, if, if you're considering epilepsy surgery, for your child, you need to be at a very, very specialized center because you can easily be misguided and go down a path of surgery uh, and not have a good outcome, or you can be told that your child's not a good candidate when in fact they may be an excellent candidate. So what have we done here at UCLA to try to figure out exactly where the seizures may be coming from? So this is uh, out of UCLA. So we've, we've taken the brain MRI, we've taken a PET scan, which is usually in the form of a CT scan, and we fused them together to give us this third image on the right. And in this image, we can see, so the, normally the left and right side of the brain should be equally active. So you need to see symmetry in the brain. And when you, when you look at the brain uh, head on here, you can see the left side of the brain is much more active than the right side of the brain. The, the images of the brain are, are flipped. So when I point to the right side of the picture, that's actually the left side of the brain. And when I point to the left side of the picture, that's the right side of the brain. And you can see where these tubers are, there's not a lot of metabolism. So you see that blue color as opposed to the red or the orange. And those are potential spots where the tubers are that could be causing the epilepsy. So this is one of the first things that we do for every patient. And it really is helpful with us to try to at least narrow it down to a few tubers where they're most hypometabolic or, or the least active parts of the brain. And to do this, we really need a team approach. So here's, here's a picture of us here at UCLA. And you can appreciate there's more than 20 doctors in this room. And we're very carefully uh, reviewing every piece of information that has come during a pre-surgical workup, uh, including the video EEG, the MRI, the PET scan, the uh, neuropsychological testing. And we very carefully uh, discuss this to see if, first of all, we can offer surgery. And if so, we can offer uh, a surgery, what is uh, the likelihood of seizure freedom uh, and um, to make sure that there's no risks or consequences as a result of surgery. So you really need a large team approach with very specialized training in tuberous sclerosis complex. So the two main operations that are performed are either a lesionectomy or a lobectomy. So lesionectomy refers to removing individual tuber or tubers in the brain. As you can tell here, this is an area that has been removed that contained a tuber. Lobectomy, on the other hand, refers to removing an entire lobe of the brain. So in this case, this is called the temporal lobe. As you can see, this is what it looks like on the other side. But for this side, this brain has been fully removed. And um, so, uh, so this is an important consideration. So if your child's being considered for surgery, you need to ask your surgeon, are we doing a lesionectomy, meaning only removing the tuber, versus a lobectomy, which is a little bit larger of an operation. So uh, this is a large study that we did, that uh, I headed, which we've looked at about 10,000 different uh, articles uh, related to tuberous sclerosis, and we've narrowed them down to 20, uh, where uh, they have reported on 100, about 180 patients with tuberous sclerosis. And as you can imagine, tuberous sclerosis is really, really rare diagnosis. So when we gather about 180 participants, that's a very, very large study on tuberous sclerosis. So try to figure out what are the successes of surgery. And here we found that a good seizure outcome can be achieved in about 70% of children. So that means either a class one outcome, which means free of all seizures, or a class two outcome, which means you have rare seizures, or only, only once in a while. And we consider those really good outcomes. And predictors, we were looking at what are the factors that may predict a good seizure outcome in these children. And we found absence of generalized seizures. So if the onset of the seizure looks like it's involving both sides of the brain, that's not a good predictive sign. Uh, 
no or mild developmental delay, so the less developmental delay the child has, the more likely we can result, it can result in a good outcome. Making sure all the EEG abnormalities are in one particular focus of the brain. And lastly, if your EEG and MRI correspond with the same area, so the more the tests all point to the same area of the brain, the more confidently I can say that removing that area of the brain can result in seizure freedom. So I followed this up by doing a study with six major centers across the country, both in the United States and Canada, that are considered some of the experts in uh, tuberous sclerosis complex. And here we put all the data together, roughly 80 patients from across both countries. And one of the things I looked at is over the long term, how do these kids do? How, how long does seizure freedom last? And although we traditionally think of seizure freedom, um, knowing how well the child will do after about a year from surgery, we realize that with tuberous sclerosis, a year doesn't really tell you the whole picture. Here when I've looked at how long these seizures, uh, patients are seizure free, at about one year out, it is close to that 60% seizure freedom. But the longer we follow these children out, the higher likelihood of them having recurrent seizures. So looking at it only across one year or two years doesn't tell you the whole picture. Now, if you can appreciate, this curve does straighten out. So over time, the longer you go without having a seizure recurrence after surgery, the more likely you'll never have seizures again. Now I must say that when we look at this, we never really count the seizures around the time of surgery. Seizures around the time of surgery can be very, very common. And just because you have one doesn't mean you failed. You have to really wait out several months, usually at least a year before you can tell. So we're ignoring any seizures that happen around the time of surgery. Lastly, I wanted to look at the children that have tuberectomy, so removing the tuber itself versus a larger resection or a lobectomy, which ones do better? Obviously, we want to remove the least amount of brain necessary to stop the seizures. But when we look at this, the children that have had larger resections, more than just the tuber itself, have done much better than the children that have had a tuberectomy only. So there's a higher chance of having recurrent seizures when you've had the tuberectomy only procedure. So what does that tell you? That tells you that the tuber itself may not be what, what's causing the epilepsy. It actually may be that tissue surrounding the tuber and commonly there's cortical dysplasia around the tuber, and that could be the cause of the epilepsy. So, that, so that's very important. So this has kind of led most people away from doing very small resections of tubers alone, or even laser treatment, which I'll talk to you about in a second, of tubers alone, because often it's the area surrounding the tuber that can be causing the seizures. So every once in a while, if we don't have enough data, uh, we may have to do something called an invasive EEG implantation. So what that involves is we do a surgery where we implant a grid of electrodes on top of the brain. And here, uh, once we implant this, the child comes back to the ICU where we hook them up to the monitor and we try to record as many seizures as we can. And that usually tells us where exactly the seizures are coming from with much more precision than before. Not only we can tell that, but we can also do uh, something called brain mapping, where we can figure out where exactly the motor area of the brain is, the sensory area, the language area, and make sure that any area that we need to remove does not involve those important areas of the brain. Now this can only usually be done in a child that's over two or three years of age. We need a child who's old enough and cooperative enough for us to be able to do our brain testing. So here at UCLA, we've sort of um, pioneered or we're one of the uh, centers that relies as little as possible on invasive EEGs and usually we're able to uh, have a pretty good guess of where the uh, seizures are coming from just based on our non-invasive uh, testing. Now every once in a while this may be necessary and we're more than capable of doing that, but we have generally taken a less invasive approach to figure out where the seizures come from. There's a new technology that's out there and it's called laser treatment. So here, um, you know, this child has a lesion or spot in the brain 
that we can target through, you don't need to do open brain surgery, so instead of doing a big incision on the head, we trim a little bit of the hair here, and we insert a fiber that goes right into the spot that we need. And we can use thermal energy, so heat energy, to really cook this spot up and destroy that tissue and treat the epilepsy. Now this has been tried for tuberous sclerosis, and the early results show that they're not as effective as traditional open brain surgery. But this could be an option in certain cases, so that's something that I would uh, encourage you to, to at least ask your surgeon about. But uh, one of the reasons this is usually not as effective is because, as I mentioned before, tuberectomies themselves are usually not as effective as larger operations, and that's because it's not just the tuber, it's the area surrounding it that can also be very abnormal. And lastly, I want to show you this. So, now, so nowadays, what we can do is use virtual reality so we can take all the images of the brain, put them together, and it allows me to sort of fly in to the brain, figure out exactly the area that may need to be removed, and sort of rehearse this operation before we get there. So here is a lesion or spot in the brain that uh, was eventually diagnosed as a, as a tuber, and we're able to really see the surface of the brain or what the brain may look like in relation to the important veins and st other structures of the brain just so when we are there right in surgery I know exactly what that area looks like and I can recognize even the pattern of the brain and that's very important because when you actually look at the brain the brain may not look abnormal so we rely a lot uh, here at UCLA on some of our virtual reality technology to really rehearse and practice and make surgery as effective as possible. So here's a case example that I wanted to uh, show you to highlight sort of a new frontier in epilepsy surgery and something that we do here, uh, and we're probably one of the only centers in the world that has a lot of experience with this, but it's something called high frequency oscillations or HFOs. HFOs have been shown, perhaps they are biomarkers of where the seizures are originating in the brain. So um, here I can show you an example. This is a child, it's a four-year-old child that has had a previous uh, resection uh, before uh, they, they came to me of a large tuber, you can appreciate here, in this portion of the brain. Now uh, the previous surgeon had removed only a partial component of this tuber. So, uh, and we know that when you do surgery for tuberous sclerosis complex, you need to really remove the whole tuber. Partial tuberectomies don't really work. Uh, and we can, with our PET scan, we can see this area is still very hypometabolic or very abnormal. And what we did is we went to surgery and we put our EEG electrodes directly on the brain and we figured out exactly where these spikes were coming from. And they, this is difficult to see, but this shows that marker that I was talking about, the high frequency oscillations, which is starting to be thought of as one of the most important markers of epilepsy, where in our experience, if that's not removed, there's a very, very high chance of seizure recurring. So that's a good way that we can predict during surgery that whether or not an area needs to be removed for us to achieve seizure freedom. So that's become very, very useful, and here at UCLA we've been looking for HFOs, both pre- and post-resection. So when I come out of surgery, I can very much more confidently than before tell the family that I think we got all the abnormality or not. And traditionally, you do the surgery and you have to tell the family to wait for at least a year until we find out. So here's a few uh, of my surgical pearls. I spent a lot of time treating tuberous sclerosis complex and I'm the main epilepsy surgeon here at UCLA, and we specialize in tuberous sclerosis, so we have a lot of uh, pearls that we've picked up uh, along the years that I'd like to tell you about uh, the surgical management of um, epilepsy and tuberous sclerosis complex. One is that incomplete resections of tubers don't work. So if you have a large tuber and you remove a part of it, that doesn't, that doesn't work. And we generally have to go back and at least remove all of the tuber, if not some of the surrounding brain that may be abnormal or may contain cortical dysplasia. Second, you need to remove not only the tuber, but usually with a tuber there's a, uh, 
abnormality in that white matter that I talked about that goes all the way down to the ventricle. And if you can appreciate here or here, there's a subtle grayness in this white matter here that is a sign of abnormal cells all the way from the surface of the ventricle, the fluid spaces, to the surface of the brain. And to have a good outcome, it's very important to not only remove all of that, but all the way down to the ventricle. So a good resection usually means that the surgeon ends up in the fluid spaces of the brain at the end of the operation. And once you're there, you know you have all the abnormality. Just removing a small piece on the surface may cause seizures to uh, be generated from those deeper abnormalities in the brain. We found that um, analysis of HFOs both prior to and after the surgical resection is very, very helpful in telling us whether there's further uh, tissue there that can cause seizures. And lastly, um, uh, like I mentioned before, it's very important to not only check before you've removed uh, the tissue, but also after to make sure that there's, you don't need to extend the resection in any way to achieve seizure freedom. I want to transition a little bit about talking about palliative treatments for tuberous sclerosis complex. Not every child who will be worked up for potential surgery will be a candidate. Some of those situations may be that the, t that the seizures are as arising from multiple tubers of the brain or they're, or they're um, uh, starting from the entire brain or it's called a generalized epilepsy. And in those situations, removing s one portion of the brain may not be effective. Or you may find that in an older child, if the tuber is located in a very eloquent area of the brain that carries a lot of function, that it may not be safe to remove that part as that can cause an unwanted neurological deficit. So in those situations, vagal nerve stimulation is a great alternative for these children. This is an implantable device that wraps around the nerve, one of the main nerves that goes to the brain is called the vagus nerve. And it's a pacemaker-like device that sits under the skin, right over the chest, and it generates electrical signals that go through this nerve to the brain. And this can cause a significant reduction in the number of seizures and also the severity of these seizures. And uh, it is a great alternative for children that are not candidates for epilepsy surgery. Lastly, I want to talk to you about a procedure that's becoming less and less uh, popular here in the United States, but uh, is still sometimes a very good option. It's called the corpus callosotomy. Here, for a very specific type of seizure, which is called the um, atonic seizures, this is a sudden loss of tone which results in falls. Your child may fall and hit their head or hit their arm and hurt themselves, that removing the corpus callosum, or this is the main highway of the brain where the left and the right part of the brain communicate, by doing open surgery to remove that structure, it prevents seizures from starting from one side and going to the other side, causing the fall. And it can be a very effective treatment uh, for that specific seizure type without the need to put in a permanent implantable device like a vagal nerve stimulator. So take home messages here about tuberous sclerosis is that children affected with tuberous sclerosis commonly can develop spasms or seizures that are usually not responsive to medical therapy. Although we want to start with medical therapy, usually uh, they don't respond completely. Now, in order to prevent harmful long effects from uncontrolled seizures, you need very careful and timely consideration of resective epilepsy surgery. We want to do this. Once we've established that the child's not going to respond to further medications, we want to pursue the surgical treatment as soon as possible. The sooner we can do this, the higher likelihood of a good surgical outcome. The reason why is also that as the child is younger, there's more brain plasticity or the brain's ability to rewire itself. So um, we can be more aggressive in making sure we remove all the abnormal parts, knowing that the brain will recover and likely uh, uh, regain a lot of those functions that may have been lost from surgery. The longer you wait, this may not be an option. And also the other thing is, if your child is a good candidate for epilepsy surgery today, it doesn't necessarily mean that they may be a good candidate down the road because seizures beget seizures. The, the longer the brain has been seizing, uh, the more likely that other spots in the brain that 
weren't generating seizures can start generating their own seizures, and your child may not be a candidate for epilepsy surgery. And lastly, just want to reiterate that in, in appropriately selected children, surgery can stop seizures completely or significantly reduce the frequency and severity and really improve the long-term cognitive outcomes. And that's one of the, the key factors, that to give the child the best chance of the best outcome possible, we really need to do our best to try to stop or limit the seizures as much as we can safely. Here at UCLA, we, uh, as along with many other centers across the country, we have designated tuberous sclerosis clinics. I definitely urge you to look at uh, what may be available in your area. And this is a very rare genetic disorder that, uh, in my opinion, really needs a very designated clinic to, to look after these children most effectively. And uh, uh, smaller hospitals may not be adequately uh, treating this disorder or, sur um, or surveilling uh, or doing adequate surveillance on a child um, if they don't have significant experience with this. So I encourage you to check to see what's available in your local area and get connected with the uh, designated uh, clinic in your area. So here's Dr. Joyce Wu and myself, and Dr. Wu is the director of our um, tuberous sclerosis uh, clinic here at UCLA, and we have a lot of experience, and, uh, and we have a lot of patients that we care for uh, collectively in this clinic. Oftentimes, it's also uh, important to send a child to see a geneticist, ophthalmologist, a cardiologist, a pulmonologist, nephrologist, dermatologist, so there's a lot of specialists that we work with. Again, I specialize in the surgical treatment of epilepsy, but oftentimes it's very important to get a lot of these other specialists on board as well to, to get the most effective surveillance and uh, treatment when necessary. Here's a couple uh, great resources. Um, one, uh, you can go on our website here. The tuberous sclerosis uh, complex uh, program will give you some more information regarding tuberous sclerosis complex and also direct you to our uh, clinic. A great uh, organization and a uh, huge advocate of children with tuberous sclerosis is the Tuberous Sclerosis Alliance where you can find uh, extremely, extremely valuable information uh, by, um, uh, on this website that can be very helpful. Uh, and I hope to uh, answer any questions. Thank you for your time and listening to this webinar and I hope to answer uh, questions that you may have. Okay, so uh, the first question is, can tubers grow back? That's an excellent question. So I would say that tubers generally don't uh, tend to grow back, um, uh, except for um, if you have SEGAs or those tumors in the brain, that can actually grow. So that's, that's something that's important for us once that's established, to follow it in the long term to make sure that it doesn't regrow or get larger with time. Can new tubers start to cause seizures? Yes, they can. So sometimes after epilepsy surgery and when you've identified one or two abnormal tubers that you've successfully removed, down the road a different tuber that may not have been seizing before or may have been seizing but the signals have been completely uh, overshadowed by these very, very abnormal tubers can decide to generate their own seizure. So it's very important to have long-term follow-up after surgery. And lastly, is laser therapy of tubers always an option? Um, I wouldn't say it's always an option. A laser therapy uh, is an option, and uh, uh, depending on the area that needs to be, um, uh, area of the brain that needs to be destroyed to stop the seizures, if that area is small enough, laser can be a good option and a minimally invasive option. But generally, the successes aren't as effective as uh, traditional open brain surgery, uh, as we have seen. Thank you for your time. It's been a pleasure, and uh, uh, thanks for listening.